And so, Professor, whenever we want. Gracias, Pamela. Thank you. So <laughs> I think you need to let me share. Okay, now it's possible. Thank you, Pamela. Okay. Yeah. Okay, gracias, Pamela. So, should I start? Yeah, whenever you want. You see it, right? You see the slides. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. okay. So this was the the ending point yesterday. I said there is, uh, of course, uh, as I explained before, nothing emerges spontaneously out of nothing, right? There was a pre-history of this topic, but there is, and then there were the the traditional. Uh, the classical contributions in control theory and optimization theory that uh, contributed a lot to also in functional analysis, of course, that contributed a lot to also in numerical analysis, right? Uh, finite differences, finite elements, all these generated, you know, somehow the micro cosmos, the conditions in which machine learning could start developing uh, in a very efficient and rapid manner, right? And then uh, one of the seminal contributions is this paper by Sibenko that, as I said, is a beautiful paper. You can even use it to, to teach in, the, in a master course, right? On, um, uh, say, uh, approximation theory, for instance, right? And this is what Sibenko said. Sibenko said, let us consider a sigmoidal function that we denote by sigma. What is a sigmoidal function? It's just a function taking limit one and zero or zero or one, doesn't really matter. So it can be a heavy side function, one, zero, or it can be an arc tangent function. And any function you can think of, you know, taking two different asymptotes as zero and one, okay? So this is a sigmoid, okay? This is like the atom on which you will build your approximation theorem. And then he said, the only thing I need to do in order to generate a dense class of functions, of course, this has to be made precise. I mean, you can prove density in L2, in LP, in C0, and so on. And this is true in 1D, but also in multi-D, uh, in the Euclidean space in general. The only thing you need to build a dense set of functions is to allow me to combine, of course, capital N goes to infinity, as in every approximation theorem, Fourier series, you have to take the number of Fourier coefficients going to infinity. For polynomial density, you need, of course, the order of polynomials to go to infinity. The same here, the capital N in the linear combination of these uh, sigmoids has to go to infinity. Of course, as usual, you take some coefficients alpha j. But what is really novel here is that you need also some nonlinear dependence on the parameters because you are using parameters theta to translate the sigmoid. So 
you can think, for instance, of a nice sigmoid, uh, you know, going from zero to one and being centered at x equals zero, where at x equals zero, you take, for instance, the value one half, something very symmetric, taking one half at zero. Then with the theta, what you are doing is you are translating the center of gravity of this sigmoid. And then, but you also need a scaling factor y, which uh, what does is when y is very large, then you are compressing the interface. I mean, this sigmoid is like a front, like a wave going from zero to one. And then when y increases, you are compressing this transition, making the slope of this transition layer to be very high and the, and the width very thin. Or you can take y to go to zero. And then by the contrary, you are making, you are dispersing this sigmoid, right? So that it gets longer and longer and longer and, you know, with a milder, you know, slope. Okay, so these are typical examples. The hyperbolic tangent as a typical example of sigmoid. And this is another one that is very much used in, in modern uh, machine learning is what is called the ReLU. And ReLU stands simply for rectified linear unit, right? Rectified linear unit, meaning that this is the function simply x plus that we use very often in PVs also in order to prove a priori estimates by you know using test functions that depend non-linearly on the solution, the, you know, the maximum principle or LP estimates and so on. Okay. Well, you will tell me this doesn't fulfill the condition of having a limit as s go to zero or going to infinity to be one. Okay, fine. Maybe at that time <coughs> Sivenko was not thinking on this example, but you get the same result for this specific choice of the sigmoid. Okay, so in the rest of my talk, I will be mainly thinking on this sigmoid, which as it happens often in control theory, uh, is less smooth, right? So this one is very nice, very smooth. The one to the left, I see there is some delay on the video, sorry. Uh, the one to the left is more smooth, right? And then from an analysis perspective, we can say, oh, this is nicer because it's a smooth. But in practice, in control theory, smooth functions are not so easy to implement. And this is why often we prefer bump-bank controls. Bump-bank controls, which are just switching between minus one and plus one, that is much easier to implement. This is the light, the light in office. You turn it on when it's dark, and you turn it off when there is enough light, on and off, right? So then in control theory, there is always this uh, compromise this balance between a smooth strategies that are harder to be implemented and then uh, bump bank piecewise constant strategies that are simply simpler to be implemented right and simultaneously less smooth the same here for the sigmoid you can say well relu is Lipschitz, but is not c1 this is true on the other hand the ReLU makes a, a clear splitting of the real line into two parts, the left zero and the right, the identity. So if you ask me what is the value of the ReLU, I can be very precise. For X negative is zero, for X positive is X. While in here, there will always be some ambiguity depending on how steep is this transition. Okay, anyhow, what do you get when you take such a linear combination of sigmoids translated and eventually through these parameters y, you know, uh, escaped. Well, basically what you are simply doing is a approximation through the sigmoid, the superposition of these sigmoids of a simple function that is piecewise constant. And you know already that piecewise constant functions, you know, simple functions, are dense, right? This is the basics of, of, of Lebesgue, say, uh, measure theory. So you see that actually, what you are doing with sigmoids, if you glue them together, translating and choosing well the slopes, you are, you are simply realizing a, a smooth surface, which is approximating any kind of piecewise constant approximation of, of a, a measurable function. Simple functions, piecewise constant being dense, then sigmoids are also dense. Okay, fine. 
And this is what is called the universal approximation theorem. As I said, this is a functional analysis theorem. You could teach it in the class on approximation theorems and say to students, well, you know, we know polynomials are dense. This is uh, Stone by Strauss. We know that uh, Fourier series are dense, Fourier. Uh, we know that uh, say infinity and compactly supported functions are dense in every LP and so all the spaces and so on. This is just cutoff and convolution. And then there is a fourth category of these functions, which can be uh, generated by this sigmoidal approximation principle. Okay, this is just one more example of, of density. Okay, and then what has this to do with machine learning? Well, it does because you know that what really uh, people found fantastic was to say, well, if this kind of object can approximate every function. Now, whatever the applied context is, you give me a data set corresponding to any phenomena in uh, engineering, in informatics, in science, uh, in nature, right? Uh, temperature, wind, uh, weather, whatever, economy. Then, okay, you give me a data set. And because these functions are dense, I know immediately that I will be able to represent, I will be able to interpolate these data sets through this kind of sigmoidal functions, which of course, due to the fact that these sigmoids are making very sharp and smooth or say non-oscillatory, I will say, sharp and non-oscillatory transitions between one value and another, like here from zero to one or here from zero to any, any, any value X you can think of, right? Then you are generating approximating families which are not oscillatory, right? So this will have much less oscillations than those you see in the Gis phenomena for Fourier series of the classical overshooting of polynomial approximation, okay? People said, that's very nice. It's very easy to understand. And then whenever you give me a function to approximate or a data set to be represented by this function, the only thing I need to do is to choose these parameters, theta, y, alpha, and also, of course, the number of ingredients, capital N, and that I can do it by a least square approximation principle. Well, this is true, but there are some inconveniences because if you will formulate the computation or the approximation of these coefficients alpha, y, and theta in a least square sense, so given a function f in L2, find the function in this category so that the distance in L2, the norm in L2 of the difference is minimized, you realize that here you have linear dependence on alpha, that's great. So you see convexity of this function with respect to alpha, but of course you pay the price of being nonlinear on y and theta so that the functional will not be convex any longer on these two other extra parameters. So this is in principle an easy, problem in the calculus of variation. However, there is no convexity. So finding the global minimizers might be difficult, but still uh, the maths you need to understand these are elementary. You can certainly uh, computationally apply a gradient descent algorithm, right? To, to compute a good approximation of the parameters. And this is how the theory started. Then, of course, uh, people realize that, well, when you are in high Euclidean dimension, when the number n of parameters you need is growing, right, the, the dimension of the approximation space is growing, then you can be facing the course of dimensionality. Computing gradients can be very expensive because there are many directions in which you have to compute uh, directional derivatives, uh, partial derivatives. Then people said, OK, let us apply then the stochastic version of the gradient descent algorithm, which is a much faster manner to find a reasonable, say, uh, fitting of these parameters. And this is what is called the learning process, right? So machine learning, learning means given a function or given a data set, learning is simply identifying the parameters alpha, y, and theta, right? That with such an ansatz is able to approximate the given reality well. Of course, this is a very basic definition of learning, right? There is much more about it, but this gives you an idea of uh, you know, how 
this uh, terminology arises, machine learning. As I said the previous days, machine refers actually to mathematics, right? Machines that have to do the job of humans, so to make the human free, right? And then this machine here will be this, uh, say, sigmoidal approximation. And then learning, learning means that you have to learn, you have to identify what the parameters are so that once you know this, you forget about the problem of origin. Of course, never you forget about the problem of origin, you have to go back to it. But let's say that for a while, for developing the mathematical methodology you want to implement, right? You will simply ignore what uh, the origin of the problem, you will focus on this function and you will work with it, right? Because you know already, you have learned the parameters and therefore you know you are dealing with this function. You are not dealing anymore with the original function f of x that maybe was very complicated. Uh, it could be coming from some uh, electrocardioencephalogram. You forget about that f of x, you just consider this one, right? Or could be the evolution of the stock market. You forget about that one, just focus on this one. Or in case you have a huge data set, very hard to manipulate, right? You forget about the data set and you simply focus on this function you have learned in order to develop your math, okay? And then people said, I can use that for classification. And for classification, you clearly see the need of a machine. I think I was explaining this the first day, the classification problem everyone understands. You have to classify trash, you know, plastic goes to the yellow, glass goes to the green, paper goes to the blue, uh, bio-organic goes to the gray. Okay, of course, uh, I as a human, I can do this task. Uh, some, some, you know, in some cases I can have some doubts. For instance, here you see a cigarette is on paper. I'm not sure this is totally correct. Okay, you, you might have doubts, but as a human, you can essentially do this task with a very high accuracy. Now, of course, uh, this takes you the full time, right? So, I mean, uh, classifying trash will be a, 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 a problem in which if you don't automa make it automatic, right? You will keep uh, many people working just to make sure that every bottle goes either to yellow plastic or to green glass. So we would like to build a machine. And actually here, for instance, in Germany, when you go to the supermarket, you put the bottle in a machine and the, and the machine tells you, okay, you have uh, eight cents every time you return a, a glass bottle and 25 cents every time you return a plastic bottle. In the end, once you bring your, all your bottles back to the, to the supermarket, you get a ticket. And with this ticket, you say 83 cents. When you go paying, you have a discount, okay? So there is a machine that has learned to identify, you know, plastic and glass, okay? And we are going to do this through, say, a, a neural network. What is the way to proceed? Okay, now you say, I have to learn how to do it. I have to build the sigmoid function so that once the sigmoid function is built, this is the machine in the supermarket, whenever someone comes with a new bottle X, the sigmoid will say, this bottle is either say zero, yellow or one, you know, glass, plastic or glass. So how do I learn this uh, sigmoid nonlinear neural network? A neural network is just an object like this built out of a linear combination of these sigmoids, which however are depending nonlinearly on theta and y. How do I learn this neural network? Well, what I will do is I take a collection of cases in which I already have the right answers. These are a number of data, xi, right? So that are living in the space Rd. Rd can be the space of shapes or can be the space of colors or can be just photos. So this will be the space of pixels, right? The dimension D will be the same as the number of pixels on a on a, on a photo, on a picture, right? So you have a collection of XIs from one to capital N. So this capital N, sorry, is not necessarily the same as in here. I should use a different notation, maybe P. You have a collection of data. And for each of them, you know already what the answer is because you have chosen this data to be representative. So there is no ambiguity, right? 
this is yellow, this is green, and so on. And once you have this collection of, say, P data, right? You have P data for which you have both the item fully characterized by the vector X in R at the dimension D, and you also have the labels, right? That could be just yellow, green, blue, and, and gray. It could be a scalar or it could be vectorial, but typically the, the, the labels are very, are very simple elements that are sufficient to identify each item. Now, because you have a function that apparently, at least there should be a function, this is what we aim. We are aiming a function that will bring every X you know, item to every Y label category in which this item should be classified. I know I can build this using a neural network and that's it. This is, you know, supervised learning. Why supervised? Because you are doing an, you know, offline a priori work in which you have chosen, right? This is like the teacher in a school, right? This is supervised learning. The teacher has chosen which material the teacher is presenting to the student, uh, you know, with which level of, you know, detail, depth, and so on, how fast, etc. which are the exercises. This is supervised the same here. You have chosen these items in a you know, coherent way, a priori, so to be successful, okay? Now, uh, soon after that paper that was published in this journal, Math Control Signals and System, at that time, Eduardo Sontag was the, the, one of the editors in chief of, of these papers. There were some articles on the control of uh, systems uh, related to the signals. But it took a while until, you know, much more recently, you know, you see papers starting in 2016, 17, and so on. People came back to this subject. People said, well, rather than, you know, just doing uh, a, a neural network piling up all the sigmoids in one shot, why don't we simply compose the sigmoids in an incremental manner. If you do that, then you have a time discrete dynamical system in which in every step from the previous configuration of the items X, you move into a new configuration of the items in an incremental manner. How do you apply this increment? There is a step size, little h, you can regulate it, but typically a small. And then you correct a little bit the collocation of each item by applying this sigmoid function. A sigmoid function in which still you have to choose the parameter b, which before in the, in the Sivenko paper were theta, uh, the matrices a that in Sivenko's uh, uh, result were you know, the vectors y and the amplitude factors w that in Sivenko's paper were alpha, okay? And then people said, well, but if you are doing this in a time discrete manner, uh, you can think on h going to, uh, to zero, and then you are in the context of this, uh, say, neural ordinary differential equation or sigmoidal, uh, uh, you know, uh, ordinary differential equation. What is a sigmoidal or neural differential equation? It's just a differential equation in which the nonlinearity is sigma. Okay, that's all. And then, you know, b. A and W, they become just control parameters. Oh, so this is a nonlinear control problem for a nonlinear differential equation. The gain being in a given time window, be able to choose the parameters B depending on time, control, you know, depending on time, A depending on time, control, and W depending on time, three controls. Of course, each of them with a corresponding number of components that play in a, a distinguished role, right? so that the system goes from the X to the Y. But now, if you think a little bit more on this, uh, you realize that the exercise is complicated. It's a little bit like the, the Rubik's Cube, because in the Rubik's Cube, you say, yes, I know I have to place the yellow in the corresponding position, the corresponding phase of the yellow. Yeah, but uh, while placing the yellow with the yellows, I have to make sure that the pink goes with the pink and the blue with the blue. So it's an ensemble or simultaneous control problem in which 
for this OBE, the same control, the same control has to drive every item to every destination and this for all the items you have in your say supervised data set from one to n or from one to p if you wish oh then you say this is about simultaneous control of a system so the system has dimension d D is the dimension of the pixels. I mean, how many pixels there are in each photo or, are, or is the space of shape? So D is the space in which this vector evolves, right? So D is finite given. It can be even 2D if you wish, something very simple in which you simply take into account some, some size uh, and some rotation angle, it will be just 2D, for instance, right? If you were simply dealing with dilations or rotations of any given object, this will be a a two-dimensional space, just X, or it can be very large if you are, you know, making a very fine representation, high resolution, you know, image, right? It will be many, many pixels, then the dimension D will be very large. But please take into account that independent of what the dimension D is, that once you fix your problem, the dimension D of this OD is given, then in this supervised learning problem, the number of items, right, or the number of initial data to be controlled, which is the same, could be arbitrary. And then you wonder, well, this is a bit too much, right? So we want the same ODE in the same dimension to be simultaneously controllable, regardless how many initial items I have. Well, that's surprising. Can this be true? And this is where the theory from a control perspective has started. People say, well, how do these functions look, sigma like this? Do we know these functions from the classical models in mechanics? Well, not really, right? Uh, when you look to, I don't know, logistic equations in math biology, log Cavalterra, or you look, uh, you know, uh, fluid mechanics equation, Navier-Stokes, quadratic nonlinearities, Barger's. Maybe in combustion you have exponential nonlinearities. Uh, if you look to you know you know these problems of, of driving a car, of course there is plenty about rotation angles. So there are many trigonometric functions in the nonlinearity of your problem. You have nonlinearities of all kinds in uh, continuum mechanics but you very rarely encounter such a nonlinearity. This is a very surprising nonlinearity because you see, what does this ODE do? At any time, right? This ODE will simply be X prime equal to W times sigma. And we know that sigma is zero on half of the space and then is linear on the other. So this means that this ODE at any time is keeping half of the space frozen, right? Like the North Hemisphere is cold, is frozen. And, and the Southern Hemisphere, you know, is evolving exponentially because it's summertime, okay? But now, because you are able to choose these parameters, B, A, and W, as you want, at any time, you can really decide which is the frozen part and which is the moving part. That's the game you can play, that's all. And this is why this is so close also to the uh, Rubik's Cube in which you have to place, as you know, every color in one face. And, but then you are only allowed, you have a lot of freedom. You can decide which face you turn, right? In which direction, but of course, you don't have complete freedom of being able to take one single piece and collocate it where you want, because whenever you decide to rotate a face, all the face rotates together, and whatever action you are doing for maybe this pixel that will go to the right place, if you are not smart enough, maybe will have an impact on the other side of the face, collocating the green one in the wrong position. Okay, this is why it's not so easy to solve a Rubik's cube. And then we are dealing now Rubik's cubes. Uh, why? Because we need to control all the items simultaneously through this nonlinear ODE. 
Okay, so what we did, uh, uh, we wrote basically several papers on this, but there is uh, two papers uh, that I will uh, present here. Uh, one of them uh, was written in um, collaboration with uh, Borjan Geskowski, um, Dario Pigin, and Carlos Esteve, where we rather adopted the perspective of optimal control. We said, listen, maybe you can think on this problem of simultaneous controllability. It is a little bit too complicated, but let us simply think on the problem for the perspective of optimal control. And in order to do that, what you have to do is you have to somehow build a functional, like for instance, this one, in which you are penalizing the distance of the solution at the final time to the target, right? Given by the labels, right? Out of the given initial data. And then you also penalize the size of the control. This U now represents the triple W, A, and B in the, in the new notation of the neural uh, ordinary differential equations. And you see here, we are using the ball phase X just to indicate that in here, when I am taking the norm of the distance between the state and the target at the final time, I am also making a, a huge sum with respect to all the items I have to control. So this is just a cost functional that is taking care of the control of all trajectories of the system simultaneously. Okay, very good. Now, what we did in that paper was we analyzed the problem from an optimal control perspective, uh, you know, existence of minimizers, how the functional can be cooked. We did simulations. These simulations were done by uh, Borjan Geskowski. I mean, you can see his uh, GitHub. Borjan is now a uh, postdoc at MIT in the team of uh, uh, Demanet, right? Uh, and in this video, for instance, you see uh, if it works, yeah. How efficient, you know, these kind of methods are from a simply numerical optimal control perspective when you try to, for instance, out of this cloud, right? In which, you know, the blues and the red are mixed in a three-dimensional, say, cube. You try to separate the red and the blues, right? The reds have to go to the right, the blues have to go to the left. You just do a numerical optimization procedure and you see that uh, the system succeeds. Well, you see there is this red here, which remains a little bit in the interface, right? You wonder whether you could not do a bit better, but of course this is often the case in the context of uh, optimal control. Why? Because in optimal control, through this penalization parameter alpha, let's see whether the alpha appears. There is some delay. Okay, so the alpha is there. Through this parameter alpha, you can either relax and allow controls U to be larger. By making alpha go to zero, I can allow controls to be larger. And then the distance of the state to the target has the tendency to diminish, right? or by the contrary, you can make alpha to be larger, then the control has to be smaller. And then of course you pay the price of being farther away from the target. So the fact that you see that sometimes the algorithm all, only succeeds 99% is related to the fact that, you know, we are choosing maybe a penalization parameter alpha that was a little bit too strict, right? But we have done that in purpose so that you see that when you are doing a purely computational, say, uh, approach to this problem using the tools of optimal control without getting into the depth of simultaneous controllability, you have to somehow regulate the parameters and you have to be careful to make sure that you are succeeding well, right? We learn very well, okay, but we learn all, only 99%, but I mean, this is accepted to be as very good. I mean, if you have a student that got in the exam 9,9 9, 9 out of 10, you say this is top, right? Nobody cares whether there was a 10. 9,9 9 is already very good. So the same here. Now we can choose the parameters slightly differently. 
and you see a different pattern, right? Again, there is a red here mixed over there. And again, we have done that in purpose. You see also how the dynamics look a little bit different. Why is that? Well, because as we learn in the context of controllability, even if you are not really interested on controllability, Right In the context of TARPI, we understood that even if you are not interested in controllability, you are just doing optimal control. Depending on whether in your functional, you just penalize the distance to the target or you, you know, penalize the distance to the target at the final time, or you do it during the whole time interval, right? The control strategies in some cases are, have the tendency to become constant TARPI and in some other cases, right, have the tendency to oscillate much more without exhibiting the TARPI phenomena. So this is also manifested in our simulations, depending on not only how we tune the parameter alpha, but how within the integral we uh, set the fact that we have to be close to the labels, the labels or either we do it only in the final time or we do it during the whole time interval, we get different motions. You can continue keep going and you can even do it with three colors, just to give you an idea, right? So with three colors, now yellow, green and purple, you want again an ODE, think that we are just building an ODE, sigmoidal ODE, in which I have to choose the control parameters, BT, AT, WT, we do that computationally, and we want this ODE, whenever you put a yellow as initial datum, it will go to the region of the yellows. Whenever you put a green, it will go to the region of the greens. And whenever you choose a purple, it will go to the, to the region of the, of the purple, right? It's like a segregation or classification procedure. And you see right, that indeed, you know, this control strategy is like uh, dancing a lot. It's quite oscillatory, but eventually we succeed. The yellow go to the northeast. So I think is this is what Recife, right? Uh, the others go to the south, green, and the others go to the purple, you know, uh, in the southwest. Same problem, different penalization functional, a different music plays. The dancing is different. The trajectory seems to oscillate a little bit more. There is more dispersion also, right? And again, we succeed quite well, right? The yellows go to the north, the green go to the east. The purples are separated, but there is much more dispersion on them. And even there is a small error here, right? Because one of the purples, right? One of the purples is mixed with the green ones to the, to the right, right? So one of the purples is gone with the greens. Again, I insist because here we are doing an optimal control computational strategy, which is subject to how we tune the parameters, right? Of course, according to the previous results on universal approximation theory, we know that if we choose the parameters well, right, then you will have as much approximation as you wish. But of course, the computational cost will be increasing. And you know, uh, concerning you know, the, the, the choice of these parameters, you have to take into account, as I said before, that contrary to classical, say, Fourier analysis, for instance, or finite element approximations, this is a nonlinear approximation procedure, which, of course, computationally is more expensive. OK? Fine. This was our first paper. And then we said with uh, Dominic Ruiz, who, who is now uh, ending his PhD with us, and now is a postdoc in, um, in Imperial College in London, right? We said, well, all these numerical experiments show a uh, great efficiency. It really seems that the system 
of neural differential equations has the property of simultaneous control, right? And then we said, let's try to prove it, okay? And here, I have bring you just an skeleton of the proof, right? Uh, but I think once you see it, you will believe me that this can be done, okay? So then let me, let me give you the, the key idea of the proof of the theorem. I mean, we could state a theorem, right? We could state a theorem here, right? So, you know, this is a, the, 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 the success of this classification algorithm. The theorem, you can read it and it will say what you expect. It will say that given a sigmoid function, for instance, the ReLU, if you consider the neural differential equation in any space dimensions B, if you are allowed to choose the controls B of T, W of T, and A of T, right? Given any dimension D and given any collection, regardless of what the cardinal, finite cardinal is, capital N or capital P, you give me the labels, which are the regions in which you know you have to separate the data. And regardless of what the dimension D is, greater than two, and what how large is the cardinal, the collection of data to be classified regardless also on how many categories you have chosen to classify the data. There were two in the original uh, blue red problem. There were three when we have used three colors. And in the case of the classification of trust, there were four categories, right? Plastic, glass, paper, and organic, right? It doesn't really matter. In, for all these problems, you always have the property of say simultaneous or ensemble controllability. Furthermore, you can do it in any time. In that sense, it's the same as Kalman. You know, the time doesn't really matter because you can, you can do it actually in any time. Of course, this will penalize the control to be larger, right? And furthermore, the controls have, can be chosen to be piecewise constant and with finitely many jumps. The number of jumps being controlled by the number of items to be classified. So in particular, your controls are not only piecewise constant, but they will also be of finite total variation, meaning that you will be able to make a Gronval estimate for the OD you will achieve once you control the system. This is what the theorem says. Now, I will not show you the proof. I just give you the idea of the proof. What is the idea of the proof? I mean, the idea of the proof is this. I mean, when we were kids, we knew how to play this game, how to play this game. And we knew, you know, we were able to do it, right? It's a very simplified Rubik's Cube. That's the idea of the proof. What do I mean by this? I mean the following. I claim that my proof goes by induction. So you give me capital N or capital T points as initial data to be classified because I was, you know, I, I am allowed to use a piecewise constant control. What I will do is I will take, I will order these points and then I will go one by one. I will first classify one and then I will classify the other and then I classify the other and then the other and so on. There are finally many. After a final number of steps, I will be able to, you know, uh, finish. Now, what I have to explain you is how I classify one, because if I am able to classify one and I understand how I do it, then I will be able to do it with the second one and the third one, and after a number of finite number of steps being done. Okay, so this is the problem. Now you have you get into the children's room. You have toys, blue toys, red toys, green toys that you have to classify into the blue band, red band, and green box, okay? And now, when you look to how these uh, toys are organized, you say, well, you know, today the children did very well. They were not so badly organized. Actually, when I look to, you know, how the toys are distributed, almost nothing is to be done because the blues, I just put them into the blue box, the red into the red box and the green into the red box is the green box is nearly done. There is, however, a problem. The problem is that there is a blue 
surrounded by red. So if I just take the red into the red box, the blue will go with them. And then out of these nine toy, say classification problem, I will fail on one. So the failure uh, will be one over 9%. So my goal is what? My goal is to rescue this blue and make sure that the blue goes with the blues so that it is properly classified into the blue box. Okay, so now question that I ask you, in here the dimension is, do, is two, we are on the plane, dimension D is equal to two, the number of items, capital N or capital M, right, is nine, there are nine items, there are three categories, right, three labels, the arrival sets are these, say, rectangles or horizontal bands, right, the question I am asking you is simply, can you please tell me how do you choose piecewise constant controls that will take the blue and put this blue with the other blue? Of course, by keeping the other red and the other green together, this is the game, right? This is like in the, in the Rubik's Cube, otherwise you will never finish. I mean, the claim is that you reduce the complexity of the organization of the, of the, of the small cubes, so that when you rotate after a number of operations, like in Kalman brackets, right, you succeed on classifying one more without losing the classification of the previous ones. How do you do that? Well, let's see what this neural lobby is saying. You see, to begin with, that it's very easy to understand why the time horizon doesn't really matter. Because whatever you achieve with this OVE in a time interval, say zero capital T, I can achieve it in the time interval zero one. Why? I simply scale time from T into say capital T times S as we were doing for TARPI. And then you see that you will amplify the, the amplitude of W, the norm of W by capital T, but the dynamics will be the same. So the time horizon doesn't really matter. The time horizon doesn't matter. We need to understand what is the role that B, A, and W play. And now recall, B is doing what? B is simply deciding where the center of gravity of the sigmoid will be. And the center of gravity of the sigmoid, after the rotation that you can generate with A, right, will determine how do you orient the equator? The equator can be horizontal, can be vertical, can be oblique. You can choose the equator as you like, and you can, with the B, you can translate it and you place it where you want. So you can think of the plane as being fully at your disposal so that you have a knife or you have a pen so that you can draw the line of the equator where you wish in the direction you wish, okay? Now, with the A, you can also enhance the slope of the sigmoid, right? And then finally, with the W, you can orient the direction of the wind in the active part. And then just to give you an example, in the case where the equator was chosen to be horizontal, I could, for instance, keep the south hemisphere frozen. I know it's the summer there, so we turn on the air conditioning we keep the south hemisphere frozen. The active hemisphere is just the north uh, one, right? But now being active, I have many possibilities. In particular, I can make the wind, you know, to be oriented in the vertical direction to the left, south to the west, and of course, in any, in any oblique direction, okay? So I can choose also the direction of the wind. And now that you know what the game is, it's very easy to figure out. Why? Well, because basically I say, okay, this was the initial configuration. What is the bad point? Is this blue. This blue definitely has to go up. How do I do that? First step, I will do it in a piecewise constant manner. First step, I put the equator a little bit above the blue. I say that the southern hemisphere is frozen and the wind is pushing the north hemisphere towards the left. 
after some time, I will be in this new configuration. Why? Because this red, this red, this blue, and this blue, these four have been moved, pushed by the wind to the left. If you look the new configuration after some time, you say, well, things didn't change much because the blue is still surrounded by these three red. Okay, but as you will see, we got something extra. Now, let me choose in the second step, the, now I stop once I get to this configuration, constant controls from here to here, just a proper choice of B, A and W. I let the system evolve and I see, as soon as I see this picture in which the two reds are to the left of the blue, I stop. This is just a short time interval, okay? I stop and then I restart. I say, okay, now I change my choices of the controls. And now I say that B, A and W are so that the equator is to the south of this point, okay? Now the active part is the southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is frozen and the wind is again pushing to the left. I let this evolve for a while. And then I realize that this red you know, this green, this green, and this green, these four that are in the active region, they move to the left. So I see that now I got something. I finally succeeded on isolating the blue to the right. All others are to the right of the blue. This means that I have a separating Harper plane, and this is where you see Han Banach behind. You know, you see the, the phantom of Han Banach behind this, this blue, right? There is a, a vertical, uh, say equator that will cut the space into two. The blue will be the only one to the right. The right side will be the active part. The left one will be the frozen one. The active part will push up and then this blue will go with the other blue and you got classification. Now, if you iterate, right? If you iterate, you can do that with as many points as you wish. And of course, you can also ensure farther and farther concentration, you know, packing better, right? Because you could complain, well, yes, yeah, so you classify the, the toys, but there is a lot of dispersion between the blue. They are occupying all the rooms. So you really want them packed in a small corner. Then if you want to, you can continue this algorithm and you can even succeed at this, right? Not only classify, but classify well, bringing the toys to, you know, very confined regions. If you ask me, can you make the three blue toys to be at the same location? Well, I mean, in practice, this doesn't make any sense because of course, if one toy occupies one point, the other toy will not be able to occupy the same point, right? That's true. From a practical perspective, you will never ask this, but from an ODE perspective either, why? because two different items driven by the same nonlinear ODE with coefficients that are piecewise constant and therefore bounded variation in which you have a, a nice well posedness result, right? And then you have a Gronval lemma, right? Two points that are distinct at t equals zero will be also different at time capital T, right? So that this means you can pack this as much as you wish Right? This will ask more and more control because you are putting pressure, you have to compactify the, the classified configuration, but you will never be able to bring two points to the same destination. This is the principle of the proof of the result. And now we understand everything because we say, oh, fine, no, fantastic. So neural differential equations have this property of simultaneous control that normal ODEs or normal PDEs don't have. And you know why do they have this property? Because such an algorithm is possible, right? And why this algorithm is possible? Well, this algorithm is possible because the nonlinearity is so that half of the space is frozen while half of the active space is moving. And this never happens with typical ODEs, you or nonlinear ODEs or PDEs take Navier-Stokes or Barger's equation. You have a, a quadratic nonlinearity. I mean, quadratic is, is, is non-zero everywhere, of course, except at u equals zero. 
but every every particle in the in the in the phase space is moving you are not allowed to make such drastic choices as we are doing here in which in every step whenever you make a piecewise constant choice of the control you are Professor, uh, sorry, your audio. Okay. Yeah, sorry, it went <laughs> automatic. Okay, and uh, just to conclude, I wanted to get to this point where once you realize what we are doing, you observe that in fact, we are doing something very similar to what Monge formulated as a problem when he formulated the problem of optimal transport. He said, I have this pile of sand blue and I have to use this sand, right? So this beach is full. This one is empty. I have to bring the sand from here to there and I have to do it optimally. This was the problem that initially, you know, uh, formulated for, for physical volumes, right? like sand or ropes or, you know, physical uh, three-dimensional, say, particles or masses, then Kantorovich put in a more abstract frame or uh, in the in thinking in the theory of economics, right? And the theory of optimal transport was developed. So, of course, the, the level of abstraction that uh, Kantorovich bring, right, was that in particular, right, if you are thinking on moving furniture to from one apartment to another, you think on objects that you have to move on a single piece. What Kantorovich realized is that when you are thinking, for instance, on the redistribution of wealth, a topic that is you know still challenging everywhere, but uh, in particular in some countries, right? The redistribution of wealth, then rather than simply thinking on you know, transferring the wealth of one individual to another, you can think on dividing the wealth of one individual, right, through, for instance, the tax system, right, and then part of it bringing to one individual and the other one to another in order to guarantee a better distribution. So now you ask me, and what is the link? What is the link of this, what we did with the theory of optimal transport? Well, there is, there is, a clear common objective that we have achieved, but there is also a, an obvious difference. When you are talking about optimal transport, you are thinking on vector fields or nonlinear functions that are arbitrary, but in which, as the optimal world indicates, you are trying to minimize some criterion, right? While in here, what we have done is to rather than optimizing any criteria, what we have done is to build a transport program or transport map, which belongs to a very specific class and is the class of functions that are given under this sinusoidal ansatz, right? So we could say, or sorry, a sigmoidal ansatz. So we could say that our theorem is not a theorem of optimal transport as Kantorovich and Mons, but it's a variant of Mons Kantorovich in which what you do is sigmoidal transport. And with this, I would like to end this uh, series of lectures. I really thank you very much. There is lots to be, you know, to be discussed, lots to be to be done in this area, but I think it's, it's time to stop. You see that. Uh, you know, machine learning emerged like a completely different topic, but through the analysis of some of the fundamental theories in machine learning, you see a lot uh, in common with the theory of ODEs, PDEs, mechanics, uh, you know, numerics, control and optimization. And of course, the same applies towards the future where, you know, there are very challenging problems, and I'm sure this field you know, will not be isolated from all others, but actually will benefit from what we know already, you know, in our own fields. And simultaneously, we'll also modify 
the way you know we think on on our field so for instance probably we will never have realized that such a simultaneous uh, controllability property might be true because we never thought of thinking on non-linearities that could be something as simple and nice as ReLU. Why? Because it doesn't appear in mechanics, indeed, but it's very natural when you are thinking on uh, supervised learning, classification, and machine learning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor, for the excellent lecture. And now questions or comments? Yeah, <laughs> I have uh, um, some curiosities. And uh, the first one is about the simultaneous control happen just whenever we use the universal approximation theory. Sorry, can you say again? The? Uh, the, the simultaneous control happen just whenever we use the universal proximity uh, theorem? Well, I, this is a good point. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Actually, you could think on this uh, simultaneous control result as a new proof of the universal approximation theory. Why? Because what we are showing in this, universe, uh, in this simultaneous control result is that you can always build a nonlinear dynamical system under control that will take any point to anywhere, right? And what do you need in order to approximate a function f of x? You need precisely this. You need a function f, a map, so that it takes any x and brings it to the corresponding value f of x, right? So in some sense, right, you see the point of view, the, the only difference between well, the only difference, the main difference, I will say, between this initial contribution of Sivenko, Sivenko was not thinking, at least when you read the paper, he was not thinking on dynamical systems. You just, you know, he was just looking for a function f of x. And he thought, well, let me just build a function f of x by simply super, uh, superposing this kind of sigmoid deformations in a more or less piecewise constant manner or approximating a piecewise constant function. So he was just a study. I'm just building f of x. What is different in our approach is that through this concept of neural differential equations, right? We are revisiting the problem in a dynamical system manner from a control perspective and then we conclude the same thing, is that indeed, you know, there is simultaneous controllability and therefore, you know, you have also the universal approximation theorem. So in some sense, the, these are like two different uh, 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 interpretations of the same phenomenon. Okay. Okay. Um, I have one more. I don't know if... It makes sense, but uh, what means the simultaneous control relation? The simultaneous control relation. Well, that's a, also a very good question. Let me maybe uh, try to write it down. Uh, maybe we go back here to, uh, to Kalman, right? Okay. So what was the, the formulation of the problem by Kalman? Kalman said, you give me, you give me an X zero initial datum, you give me a final datum XT, and you need to find the control U that drives X zero to XT. Okay, that's the classical interpretation of the control problem. The dynamics here is linear, the control is U, you are given the initial datum, you are given the final target, and you want to build the U that will bring you X0 into XT. Okay, fine. And Kalman said, 
In order to be able to do this for every x0 and every xt, and as you observe, Pamela, to be able to do it in any time interval, the if and only if condition is that A and B fulfill this Kalman rank condition. That's clear. But now, if you proceed as, you know, by this proof of variation of constant formula, or you do it as Leon's indicated, what you observe is that, of course, whenever you compute a control, the control will depend on X0 and will also depend on XT. So in the classical control strategy, right? In the classical control strategy, whenever you change the initial datum or the final destination, the control changes. It's like yourself. I mean, you say, okay, now I am in office and in the evening I go home. Okay, then you have to take a path, right? You have to take the bus 38. But if tomorrow morning you say, okay, now tomorrow morning I'm going, I wanna go from home to the beach, then you don't take the bus 38, you, you take the bus 22 because it's a different path, right? So this is typical in control theory. Whenever you take different initial data or different destinations, you have to choose different controls. And normally, if you will ask me in the linear setting, will I be able with the same control simultaneously control two different initial data, right? To two different final locations like this, I will tell you no, because the control that I need to control the first initial datum and the control that I need to control the second initial datum, they are not the same. And what is good for one is bad for the other. Why? Because as I said, this is particularly true in linear systems, but it's even true in nonlinear systems in, in, in mechanics. Whenever you put some action, you, all the space is moving together. Now, what we have observed is that when you are dealing with neural differential equations, this that is totally impossible for linear systems or nonlinear systems in mechanics happens for nonlinear differential equations governed by the sigmoid. Why? Because the sigmoid is able to, like the Rubik's cube, discriminate between left and right. Okay, so this very property of simultaneous or ensemble controllability holds for these neural differential equations and basically is the only example we know in which this will hold. And a very simple, you know, uh, example that show you how difficult this will be is that this will be in particular completely impossible for linear systems. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you, Pamela. That Thank was a very good question. Any more questions or comments? Mm. If there are no questions, I would like to thank you, Professor, for promptly accepting the invitation to participate and mainly for your enormous contribution to our event. Thank you. Thank you very much for all thank the teaching for the, uh, and yeah. for encouraging and to keeping going. Thank you for, for your invitation, also to all the, the organizers and, and also for the, the, the audience there to be there. And of course, I am at your disposal. If anyone has any question, you can, you can send me an email and I will be happy to, to continue cooperating in the future. Okay, maybe, maybe in the future we also have the opportunity to meet, to meet somewhere right. and, and go back to a standard workshops. Okay, thank you. Thank have you. Have a weekend and end of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.